It was Wednesday morning at the memory clinic and I'd just finished my neuropsychological assessment. The psychogeriatrician had finished his pharmacological and neurological reviews and the occupational therapist was on hand to feedback as to her functional assessment of the client. We put our heads together, came to a conclusion and then sat down with Jim and his wife and his daughter to break the bad news. We told him that based upon all the information available to us, we thought that Jim had some form of dementia, probably vascular dementia. Jim sat back in his chair and breathed a sigh of relief. He said, thank goodness, I thought you were going to tell me I had Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> uh, you can imagine how sad and awkward the next few minutes were. Jim's wife and daughter had a few tears. Uh, his, uh, Demeanor was stoic. He said that he was going to try to uh, make the best of the uh, years available to him. And he thanked us for our diligence and for our professionalism. Then we moved on to the practicalities, as Rebecca mentioned. The uh, need to set up an EPOA, the uh, contacts with agencies like the Alzheimer's Society and supporting families. And we told him that Based upon the information available to us, we didn't think he should be driving anymore. And the mood changed. No longer were we diligent, caring, supportive professionals. Now we were idiots. Now we were being completely unreasonable. He and his f wife lived out in the uh, rural areas. Uh, she'd never learned to drive. Uh, they depended upon the car. They depended upon him driving. How could we possibly be asking this of him? This put me in mind of uh, a young woman that I saw when I was working in mental health. Uh, she'd referred herself for psychological therapy after the death of her father. She told me that six months on from his death, she was finding herself on occasion crying when she thought about him. Asked her if she thought this was unreasonable, and she said yes. She was a geriatric nurse. Uh, she'd seen many people die in her career on the geriatric wards and her experience of death was always the same. The family would gather around the bed, uh, people would say their goodbyes, there would be tears and other upsets. But then, uh, a few days later, a couple of members of the family would reappear on the ward with flowers and chocolates for the nice nurses who'd been so helpful to mum or dad in their last days. And they'd be all smiles. So she'd formed her own personal theory of bereavement from that, uh, that recovering from the death of a person took hours, days, and to be still crying about the death of her father six months later made her clearly abnormal. So if it hadn't been for Jim and his uh, wife's bad reaction to the news that he needed to stop driving, we could have been patting ourselves on the back for a job well done telling ourselves that we've made a good delivery of this diagnosis. If you're not there for the majority of the impact, if you don't see what happens outside your consulting room, it's very easy, like the nurse, to form a theory of how people react, how people cope, that is very different from reality. So how are we supposed to understand the psychological impact of a dementia diagnosis on our patients? on their families and on the clinicians who work with them. In 1958, Elizabeth Kubler married Manny Ross and she applied for an internship as a pediatrician. She was disqualified from that on the grounds that she was pregnant, but she was allowed to study psychiatry, which presumably made sense in uh, 1958. As an intern, and later as a resident, she lectured on the hospital management of dying patients. And 10 years later, in 1969, she published her first book on death and dying, in which she laid out the five stages of grief through which she'd observed dying patients move as they reconciled themselves to their fate. You can expect to go through five stages. The first is denial. No way, because I'm not dying. Second is anger. Are you little doctor? After that, 
comes fear. Watch out to fear. Watch out to fear. Bargaining. Doc, you gotta get me out of this. I'll make it worth your while. Finally, acceptance. Well, we all gotta go jump time. Mr. Simpson, your progress astounds me. <laughs> Over the uh, subsequent years, Dr. Kubler-Ross and her collaborators extended the uh, five stages of uh, grief to cover not only the dying person themselves, but also their spouse and anyone else close to them. And other writers extended the model even further until it's now accepted by many people that any time there's a big change in our life, death or birth, uh, divorce or marriage, uh, redundancy or a new job, that we go through a set series of stages as we adjust to the change. Two years before Dr. Kubler-Ross's death in 2004, George Bonanno and his colleagues published a paper which challenged this orthodoxy. Uh, they published the first prospective study of the bereavement reaction of spouses and found that the most common response was actually resilience in the face of the loss. The second most common response was a period of emotional turmoil as people adjusted, and by far the least common response were the stages of grief observed by Dr. Kubler-Ross in the dying people themselves. Now this is a, a result that's been replicated numerous times over the years. That's, there are some academic challenges to it, but by far the major pushback has been from people who write books about the five stages of how you have adjust to a new job, or the five stages of how you adjust to uh, leaving home. So if it is the case that we can't use Kubler-Ross's five stages to understand the reactions of people to a dementia diagnosis, what can we use instead? In the 1930s, newly arrived in Canada from Prague, Professor Hans Selye was an endocrinologist and he was studying the impact on the body of external demands. Because he was now working in an English-speaking environment, he needed an English word for his phenomenon. But he wasn't yet fluent and he made a mistake when he chose the word. He borrowed from physics the word stress, which means in physics, force that is being exerted on an area. A pressure is one type of stress. What he was actually reaching for was the word strain, which means the deformation of an object by stress. Years later, as his English improved, he realized that he'd made a mistake. He'd used the wrong term. But by that point, he'd given lectures, he'd published papers, he'd written books, and so he was stuck with the term stress. And that's been something of a liability in the study of the phenomenon. An example of this is the work of Drs. Thomas Holmes and Richard Raha. At the end of the 1960s, they created a league table of stressful events and gave this to numerous professional groups. Uh, they started with uh, US Navy sailors, they moved on to flight attendants, then factory workers, nurses. And in each group, they replicated the same finding, which was that if they asked people to tot up the impact scores of all the events that applied to them over the previous year, they were able to predict the likelihood with which someone might become physically ill in the next six months. Emotional turmoil predicting physical illness. However, the prediction wasn't very strong, partly because they would bought into the idea of stress as pressure rather than st strain, as Sally was originally intending. Uh, the example here was uh, at the top of their list is the death of a spouse. So obviously the death of a spouse is one of the most horrible things that can happen to you. Unless, of course, it's your abusive, adulterous, uh, lying, cheating spouse, when the impact might be slightly less. Similarly, at the bottom of the scale here, uh, I think you can see Christmas, <laughs> which on my personal league table would be much further up the scale. Don't you think death of a child would be higher than death of a spouse? Uh, this is the table that they came up with in the 19... 60s. And so uh, 
I'll get on to why there might be a, a greater impact for some people than others. If we consider two people and the pressure upon them, uh, Diana and Etta. Diana, as far as we can tell, has much more <coughs> pressure on her than Etta. But from what we see day to day is that Diana seems to be coping an awful lot better. Diana is strong and confident. Etta is barely holding it together. So from this, a lot of people conclude that some people just thrive on stress. Some people are strong. Is Diana some kind of Wonder Woman? Answer, no. If we also consider the support that is available to Diana and Etta, we see that possibly one of the reasons that Diana is coping so well with the great amount of pressure is that she has an even greater amount of support available to her. Whereas Etta, even though she has much less pressure on her, has even less support available to her. And it's the degree by which the pressure on Etta exceeds the support available to her, which is Dr. Salyer's concept of strain. It's the uh, strain on her body that comes from being overwhelmed by the pressures on her. So when I'm working with people who are referred as stressed, but really in Professor Salyer's intended terminology would be strained, I ask them to consider four areas of their lives Ask them to consider their, where they live and who they live with. Ask them to consider uh, their extended family, their relatives and children. Ask them to consider how they spend their leisure time and who they spend it with. And ask them to consider their work. Uh, I was once asked for a, a title when I was presenting this at a conference. And I said it was the uh, chart for the identification and treatment of stress, the CITS actually stands for the circle in the square. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an example of somebody who's, like Etta, barely holding it together. All of the supports available to the person go on the inside of the circle. All the pressures in each area of their life go on the outsides of the circle. And you can see here that it, it's a roughly even balance which means that if anything else comes along, if there's another pressure in any area, that person is going to be tipped over into strain, stress. Uh, ideally, if we wanted them to be more like Diana, then we'd need to stock the center of the diagram with extra supports, extra good things about home, extra good things about uh, contact with the family, more support on the leisure side and on the work side. Now, using this sort of formulation, I think we can understand a little better Jim's family's reaction to first his diagnosis and then the driving ban. As one of my uh, colleagues in the Waikato Memory Service used to say, uh, when we gave people a dementia diagnosis, tomorrow is pretty much the same as today. The changes as a consequence of the dementia aren't going to take place overnight. And so, Having given Jim his diagnosis of dementia, there's not going to be a vast change to the picture immediately. But if we do give him the terrible news that he can't drive anymore, then there's an incre immediate increase in problems and pressures all over the picture, and possibly a decrease in the personal supports that he's available to access. So this is more of a frame in which we can understand the impact of dementia diagnoses on people. The British clinical psychologist Linda Clare has proffered a four-stage socio-cultural model of descent into dementia. This is going to look very similar to the diagram that Rebecca showed right at the start of the day. The first stage is the slow accumulation of all sorts of minor problems that gradually lead the person, or more probably their family, to seek an assessment. The second stage is post-diagnosis, when, in, depending upon how late the diagnosis is made, a degree of independent living may still be possible, but people will gradually come across more and more challenges to that, until eventually it's necessary to enlist the aid of professional carers, respite support, etc. And then finally, when home care is no longer practical at all, some degree of residential care is required. 
Now, because it would be very difficult, uh, confusing to be talking about stage three and stage four, uh, let's look instead at the transitions between these stages. Diagnosis, the introduction into the home of paid and professional supporters, and finally, admission to residential care. I think as service providers, we tend to assume that the admission to, of a person with dementia to residential care is a relief for their carers. Certainly, we see more of the carers before the admission than after. They were calling us every day, there were all sorts of problems, and then after the admission, we see them rarely, if ever. If we do draw that sort of conclusion, we risk making the same error as the nurse made when she was evolving her own model of bereavement. In 2013, there was a review of studies of carers post-admission by Grainham and uh, colleagues, and what they reported was that most carers experienced the <coughs> admission as a depressing event, at least in the initial stages, that it was essentially the end of the line for the person that they'd been caring for. Admissions to residential care are usually forced by some sort of crisis. About 50% of admissions come for, straight from hospital. Uh, the crisis may be due to increased challenging behavior, as we'll hear about this afternoon. It might be safety concerns. It might be hygiene concerns. It might be the failing health of the caregiver themselves, who, as Jan noted, uh, will probably also be elderly and may have problems of their own. And so Graham found that many family caregivers tend to ad attribute the decision to admit to residential care to the healthcare professionals involved in the case. And maybe one of the roles that is most useful for us to play in this sort of situation is the bad guys. The people who are saying, well, yes, no, you probably could have managed a little bit longer, but as Jan has said, you know, it's my opinion, I'm the expert, that this is the time when this person needs to go into care. Relieve some of the guilt of having failed to live up to your marriage vows. Now, for a patient being admitted to residential care, as we can see, it would require, uh, involve changes and potentially losses in every area of life. New environment, uh, possibly less visits from family, uh, less contact with friends and normal leisure activities. Depending upon how engaged the person is with their environment, it could be a major or a minor dislocation. As Jan said, the uh, use of respite care to familiarize people with the environment could soften that move. But for other people, their disconnection from their environment could make the move more challenging. There's a gentleman in Bonghanu at the moment who uh, served some time in prison in his younger years. And now that he's been admitted to residential care, he believes he's back there and spends the majority of time, his time plotting escape. It might seem strange to suggest that there's a work aspect, but uh, Dr. Johnson, who Jan mentioned before, uh, used the term the other, to me the other day, which I hadn't encountered before, uh, brains and legs, to describe couples who, over the years, as the one person has descended into dementia, have still been able to cope because the person with dementia has been, still been able to do physical tasks that the other person is unable to do. And so the person with dementia may lose a role, but the person who was providing the care may actually no longer be able to stay in their home themselves, either financially or because it's impractical, because they don't have the, the legs there to cope, or uh, because there's pressure on them, either personal pressure or pressure from their family, to move house, to be nearer the residential care that their former charge is now receiving. For caregivers also, there may again be changes in frequency of family contact. Uh, relatives may feel the need to contact less <coughs> often because the problem has now been re resolved or relieved. And it may be very difficult to pick up contacts with friends, to pick up leisure activities, to pick up occupational opportunities after many years of having cared for someone descending into dementia. As Jan said, some people experience the uh, change as a liberation. Some people 
are able to uh, get away from having had to be there 24-7, constantly monitoring, unable to sleep. And so the people who are able to be liberated from their home, the people who are able to go out, resume social contacts, uh, benefit from the transition. They tend to be the younger caregivers. Crawford and colleagues in 2014 said that spouses are much more likely to be depressed, and lonely, lost, because over the years their role has been to care for their husband or wife. They said that uh, it's possible that caregivers of people with dementia suffer even more as a consequence of the residential care admission because unlike the carers for people who are still cognitively intact but require residential care for physical reasons, dementia caregivers have had to be the advocate for years and now they're no longer in the driving seat. When they visit the residential care home, they see a quite rapid de uh, <coughs> deterioration in the person for whom they've been caring. Uh, Graham noticed one, uh, reported one specific thing, which had never really occurred to me, which was that caregivers can maintain the identity of their spouse by making sure that they're still well dressed, by making sure that they've got nice clothes. But in residential care environments, the staff may value more clothes that are quick to put on and quick to remove. And so you get to see this once dapper person re reduced to somebody who looks very slobbish, very upsetting. So the uh, caregivers become helpless bystanders to this deterioration. It may be that what we have to do is help people distance themselves from that. Uh, the ultimate effect in a lot of cases of admission was that people lost interest in caring for themselves now that they no longer had the care role. They no longer had somebody to attend to their own health. Uh, sorry, they no longer had a reason to attend for, to their own health. So how do we head that off? What about the previous transition when we start introducing supported uh, supporters, paid supporters, respite care, etc., into the home environment. Henry Brodersey and his colleagues in 2003 said that family caregivers uh, usually express a great deal of gratitude for the people who come in and the offers of respite, etc. But if you look at the actual burden on the carer, it doesn't seem to change all that much. Possibly because the supports that we provide tend to be targeted at the difficulties that the person with dementia is having that the family can't cope with, rather than providing the support to actually enable the caregivers to go on and live a reasonably normal life. Brodity estimated the amount of time per week required to care for somebody with mild dementia is about 13 hours, uh, moving through 22 hours a week for moderate dementia and getting up to 46 hours for severe dementia, the sort of dementia that people would be dealing with in the last stages before admission. And so even the most supportive of care packages is only going to be half that. So people have a full-time job caring. And the supports that we provide are generally playing catch up with the stress on the caregivers. <coughs> Lopez and colleagues in 2005 found that the people who coped best with uh, caregiving, and this is going to come a real, as a real shock to you, the people who cope best are the people who didn't have to worry about holding down a job, who were able to maintain their leisure activities, who had taken on the role voluntarily, and who had previous good relationships with the person for whom they were caring. Not that many of uh, people can say that they meet all those categories. In 2010, Schoenmakers, uh, in a review of studies of the uh, experience of caregivers, commented that most studies actually have a very small sample size. And they concluded that this was because most caregivers are actually far too busy to do anything more than care, and especially engage, participating in studies is way over their ability. Kimura in 2015 said that 
a lot of people take on the full-time carer role prematurely and this cuts them off from all the supports and benefits that they might get out of the workplace, that they might get out of leisure activities. And the load on people is such that even if we do provide respite care, the actual thinking involved in benefiting, you know, making the most of the time that they have respite from caring, is maybe a job too much as well. So that people suddenly find themselves surprised to have this time to themselves. And before they know it, it's over. They don't have the time to plan how to best use that available time in order to refresh themselves and benefit themselves. Now, there was an interesting study by uh, Foth and <coughs> colleagues in 2012, where they found that people who originally had a uh, close relationship, say with their spouse, when dementia was diagnosed, coped better with the initial impact of the diagnosis, but in the long term, they suffered more as the person descended into dementia. Whereas people who were able to step back from the closeness of their relationship actually coped better psychologically with the ongoing role as they made uh, caring less of a marriage, less of a uh, loving thing, and more of essentially of a job. But paradoxically, what they found was that the people who made this separation suffered more physical health problems. Again, possibly as a consequence of having made the, their role into a job, they deprived themselves of their loving relationship and again, struggled to find meaning struggled to find uh, a reason to care for themselves. And so again, by advising people as to what's the best tactic for them at each stage of the game, we can potentially head off these problems later on. Now, so far we've been making a pretty huge assumption. And that is that the person to whom we've given a dementia diagnosis actually has dementia. In 2011, a meta-analysis by Mitchell and colleagues uh, reported that for every four people with dementia on a GP's list, the GP is likely to miss one, withhold a dementia diagnosis from half of the remainder, and offer two false diagnoses. <laughs> with the result, <laughs> that if you are someone who has been given a dementia diagnosis by your GP, at least according to Mitchell and colleagues, it's 60-40 as to whether that diagnosis is in fact correct. Mm. Yes, done more chance of it being a misdiagnosis. Uh, psychiatrists, geriatricians, neurologists miss fewer cases and their false positive, uh, they're only about 13% of their diagnoses are false diagnoses, dementia, diagnosing dementia when it isn't actually there. According to a 1997 study of geriatricians, neurologists, and psychiatrists in Fife in Scotland. I'll go on, talk a little later about why I'm quoting you such an old study. To begin with, let's look at the idea that we miss diagnoses. Why would we miss a diagnosis. A GP that I worked with once said that uh, GPs don't have the advantages of hospital specialists because they're down in the swamps, whereas the uh, specialists are up on the peaks of mountains where it's easier to see the dis separation between the different disciplines. Whereas in your general practice consulting room, you see everything and have to consider everything. There's also the fact that people's reaction in the early stages of dementia is to minimize the problem, to ignore the three or four times that they've got lost on the way to the supermarket. And given that half of older people live alone, we can't really go roaming the streets looking for people with problems. <laughs> and so we're reliant upon friends, neighbors, uh, visiting family to flag up the problems that people might otherwise have been living with. <coughs> 
People often cite the cultural acceptance of senescence as a part of aging as being a feature of other cultures, Maori, uh, Asian cultures, etc. But in my experience, it's also a part of European culture as well. People are very likely to assume that this is what happens as you get older. Interestingly, just as a, an aside, I thought this was worth mentioning, uh, another paper by Henry Brodity said that in cultures where uh, there is a tradition of a more extended family, especially extended family living under one roof, uh, the care provided to someone with dementia living in that family still tends to come from one individual. Might be the spouse, might be daughter or daughter-in-law, something like that. So the burden of care isn't evenly distributed across the family, but the person who's providing the main care still has more flexibility because there are other people around to prop them up. <laughs>